few months ago, we all marked the 45th anniversary of the Helsinki Final Act and the 13th anniversary, anniversary of the Paris Charter for a New Europe. The two documents that form the foundation of our common security. Many commemorative events were organized in Vienna in, in, and in our respective capitals. Many speeches of our commitment to the basic OEC principles were made. However, celebrations and nice speeches aside, the reality on the ground was not so shiny. At the very same time, in some OEC participating states, these fundamental OEC principles continued to be violated. From military aggression against neighboring countries, occupations and illegal annexations of their territories, to blatant violations of human rights and fundamental freedoms from non-implementation of previously undertaken commitments to unprecedented internal repressions against political opposition, peaceful protesters and independent media. We, this is what we witness regretfully every day. In her presentations to the OEC Permanent Council last month, the OEC church person in office, the Swedish Foreign Minister Anne Linde, emphasized her strong dedication to the peaceful and lasting resolution of enduring conflicts in OEC array. Regretfully, across OEC array, force continues to be employed as a method to alter established territorial borders in blatant dis disregard of our state's sovereign rights and international law. This Friday, February 26, we will mark the seventh anniversary of the start of Russia's aggression against Ukraine and the illegal annexation of the Crimean Peninsula. We continue to condemn this in strongest possible terms, and we will insist our governments to maintain respective sanctions against Russia until sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine within its international recognized borders is be fully restored. Let me use this opportunity to once again reiterate our collective call on Russia to stop it, its aggression against neighboring Ukraine and to find political will to resolve this conflict peacefully and to take necessary actions. Russia is a part of, a, of this conflict, not a mediator. It has signed Minsk agreements and Normandy summit decisions and therefore shares responsibility in implementing them. In November 2020, we again saw, unfortunately, a renewal of active hostilities in Nagorno-Karabakh conflict zone. We deeply regret the high number of causalities it resulted, both among the military personnel and civil population. We call on the sides to respect the ceasefire so that extremely serious humanitarian situation on the ground could be addressed. However, it is worth mentioning what the ceasefire agreement of November 9, 2020 ended the active phase of hostilities, but not the conflict itself. Any lasting political solution to it is only possible with the participation of the OSCE Minsk group, not just one of its members. I wish to extend our full support to the OSCE Minsk group and its co-chairs. Both sides has accused, accused each other on war crimes due to the indiscriminate attacks on civilian neighborhoods, the mistreatment of prisoners, prisoners of war. We urge those responsible to investigate such matters, adhere to the obligations enshrined in the ceasefire agreement, and encourage the swift return of internally displaced persons and refugees. I'm therefore pleased to report what the newly, newly appointed OEC Parliamentary Assembly Special Representative for South Caucasus, Mr. Bushati, has already begun consultations with the delegation from Azerbaijan and Armenia with an aim of promoting reconciliation and rehabilitation. In Georgia, occupation of a significant part of its territory continues. Instead of implementing its commitments under EU-mediated ceasefire agreement of August 20, 2008, Russia continues to neglect its role in this conflict and its resolution. Moreover, at the same time, it even increases its efforts, its efforts in integrating the Georgian regions of Abkhazia and Skin Valley region to its political, military, and socio-economic system.
So-called borderization continues. Civilian movement across the administrative boundary line remains severely restricted. Human rights of the people living in the temporary occupied regions of Georgia seriously violated. However, let me draw your attention to the landmark decision of European Court of Human Rights, January 21 of this year. It underlines Russia's responsibility for the gross human rights violations during, the, during and after its war with Georgia. The decision inter alia legally confirms Georgia's territor territories as under Russia's occupation. We call on Russia, we call on Russia to implement its, this court's decision without further delay in a, and in a good faith. Besides unresolved conflicts, we also saw unprecedented repressions against political opponents, independent media, human rights defenders, and peaceful protesters in some OSCE participating states. In this regard, the most vivid example is Belarus. We express our concern at the findings of Professor Benedict's report, prepared in response to grave human rights violations related to the forged presidential elections on August 9, 2020. We once again call on Belarusian authorities to implement all recommendations of this report and to comply with OEC commitments and international human rights standards. The solution of this crisis is only possible through inclusive national dialogue. We also should not forget the poisoning, sub subsequent detention and sentencing of Mr. Navalny, as well as the brutal attacks against the peaceful protesters in many cities of Russia. We join our international partners in their call to immediate release Mr. Navalny and to ensure the right for peace, peaceful assembly, as well as the right of opinion and media freedom in Russia. Let me also express our serious concern with the most recent detention of the leader of one of the leading opposition parties in Georgia. However, I trust the appropriate resolution will be found there soon. On top of this, we are confronted with the new challenges first and foremost related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Alarmingly, certain states and politicians have endeavored to abuse the state of emergency following the spread of the virus, to weaken parliamentary control, to tighten their grip on free and independent media, or to suppress their political opponents. Pandemic also revealed, revealed how dependent we are on technologies and how quickly various actors try to abuse it. Cyber attacks is no longer terra incognita for us. Much in this field is yet to be regulated, whereas rules surrounding the physical use of force and state responsibility have been entrenched in the international legal order for decades. This is not the case for cyber attacks. Questions surrounding, for example, the issues of attribution are pending final settlement. OEC and its structures, including OEC EPA, should pay much more attention to hybrid threats, which have already become an integral part of our national threat perceptions. Disinformation, meddling into our elections and our democratic processes, cyber attacks at, against critical infrastructure, the use of nerve agents, which, is a, which are a chemical weapon for political assassinations on our streets are just few examples of this. Finally, finally, let me also underline what the last year military transparency was further declined as a consequence of the failure to modernize the Vienna document. Small arms and light weapons remain the dominant cause of de deaths in OEC array, also when it comes to, to the treat of terrorism. We as parliamentarians must demand more concerted and resolute action by our governments so what to prevent further tragedies. Dear colleagues, we shall always remind ourselves what the OEC was founded for and what are our guiding principles. It is my firm conviction what if our predecessors were able to overcome far greater divisions and fi find common ground, so can we. After all, we must not forget what in moment of crisis, it is our role as, uh, as parliamentarians to defend the rights of our citizens, to hold governments to account, and most crucially, to promote the spirit of multilateralism. Only if we can act together in this way, we will ever attain the ideal of comprehensive security. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair.